first bill we're taking up today, and unfortunately, Senator Baruch has an, an engagement in a, some kind of a writer series at the University of Vermont that he cannot get out of and will not be able to join us. And Senator uh, White is on um, a medical excursion until 1030 and uh, will hopefully be joining us then. So right now it's just the three of us um, and we're taking up for committee discussion and any further amendments or whatever the committee wants to do with H-837 life estate deeds. And by the way, is I want to mention that H-963, for whatever reason, and this, this is getting um, frustrating. I don't know if the Rules Committee met this morning. We did. Um, but a bill, with, obviously, with sunsets and a very important bill never got approval from the Rules Committee. So that's why it's not on the calendar. Uh, it, can, it can be, Dick. We met and we agreed to let it go. Oh, go thank through. you. Good. We get, yeah. Well, thank you. So, um, well, that's what happened. <laughs> Eric wrote me last night and said he couldn't find it on the calendar. And, right. And, mm. and then um, I found out that it was actually the rules committee hadn't approved it. So I doubt they've approved this bill either. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I, I could, I guess I could ask. Uh, since Andy Michael and Joe Bauer are uh, with us. Um, and is the bill effective on passage, Eric? Uh, that's a good question. Let me check real quick. Yes. Um, it is? Yes. Yes. Okay, well, um, we would need to get Rules Committee a approval to, if we were to vote it out positively, uh, we would need Rules Committee approval to um take it up on the floor so just to well are they are rules when is rules meeting again joe i don't believe we have set up a schedule of when we're going to meet next i see well it would have to be tonight or tomorrow I, morning. yeah i could actually see this as being a covid related yeah. bill um a lot of people are thinking about their estates and what they're going to do and wills and other things so Anyway, um, we did receive, I, Peggy forwarded her to everybody, an email from uh, Mr. Uh, Attorney Pratt, Bob Pratt, who um, withdrew his objection, even though it was evidently an objection, um, because he had approved the first draft, and then there was a change in that section 655B that he was um, uh, concerned about. Um, so uh, any comments on that or any, um, we can vote the bill out 302, it's fine with me. So, so with um, Attorney Pratt's objection gone, we don't have any objections on the record to it. No, we don't have any objections on the record. And I believe that um, so uh, I, I would move that we approve H-837 as it came to us from the other body. Is there any discussion? Joe or Andy, would you like to weigh in? And Terry Corsones, since you're here. Oh, that's, uh, 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 I think the, the, we've covered everything. So thank you for your efforts. You're welcome, thank you. Okay. Terry or Andy, any comments? No, I, I agree. Sorry for the confusion uh, yesterday, but um, I, I think at the end, everything is where where uh, I think it started and where it ended. So thank you. Okay. Hi, this is Terry. Thank you so much for um, expediting it. And I agree with you, Senator Sears, that there are COVID-19 ramifications because we've had many, many inquiries about it. And this will be very helpful to people that have asked. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, since 
I mean, it could pass. It could pass tomorrow before we adjourn, and no matter when the governor signs it, it'll be effective when he signs it, assuming it passes. Because since we're not making any change, it would go to directly to the governor. So. Okay. <clears throat> Second. So, when 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 the bill get if the bill is voted out positively by the committee, then I will. Uh, Eric will send the normal email and Joe would report it, but I'll send, if you send me a copy of the email, Eric, I'll send a copy to uh, Tim Ash and John Bloomer and ask the rules committee to meet to approve the bill. Okay. So okay. just like yesterday with 963, you just send one to send it yeah. to uh, send it as, as normal, although yeah. realizing that we've got to get rules committee approval to ship it out. Sounds good. Eric, can I get a, a very short summary? Do you want yes. me to do and the Peggy, roll call I'll or no? A, Peggy, I'll need the list of witnesses. Yep. Do you want me uh, to do a roll call or no, Senator Sears? Yes, we should do oh. a roll call. Oh, okay. I thought you were finishing up. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I think we're fit. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Peggy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Senator Benning? Yes. Senator Nika? Yes. Senator Sears. Yes. All right. So, so it would be three zero zero. Okay. Uh, we could obtain Senator White's when she gets here, but since Senator Bruce won't be here, it'll be impossible for him to vote. Three zero two. Right now, it could be four zero one. Yeah. Assuming Senator White's supportive. Yeah, if she so. gets here, that'd be good. When she gets here at ten thirty, we're going to have to end the meeting at eleven. So, okay. <clears throat> Eric, thank you. Um, Peggy, sure. um, can you see if um, any of the others are ready earlier? I just emailed Luke a few minutes ago, and I have not heard back. Um, okay. I Senator, Senator Sears, is uh, it, it's 963, or maybe Senator Benning, you would know this, because is the 963 on the floor today, you think, or, is, or uh, the, the sunset bill? The sunset bill just received permission from rules to let it go through to the floor. I think there's going to be an effort to made sometime today to put it on the calendar, but I don't think it's on there yet. It could okay. be voted on tomorrow. Actually, if, if it was voted on tomorrow, passed and goes to the governor, it still gives uh, the legislature has passed it. I, you know, like we talked about yesterday, if I'm not sure a day is going to matter a huge deal if, if he signs it on the first or not. Yeah, I think that's right. So I, I would, I'd be more comfortable if we let it go on and take it off notice tomorrow. Right. You got the summary for that one, Senator Shears, right? That I do. Yes. Thank you, Eric. Okay. It's not that hard. Right. Right. <laughs> True. <laughs> you know, I some some days I just wonder about the house and it's disappointing to have to come back and renew those sunsets again next year on those same issues. That's all. That's all I would say. I mean, that, right. you know, on two of the issues, the diversion and the um, the racial disparities, we're going to have to come back next year. Um, the other one in two years so you know it's kind of it puts us right back in that same boat where if you forget the sunset you end up losing something like the diversion programs changes right or the racial disparities council well i'll hang on to the summary so we can use it again next year <laughs> yeah <laughs> well assuming that you know there is an election all right all right. All right. I see Luke is here, and maybe right. uh, Eric. Thank you again for yeah, everything. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. It's been a terrific experience. I was gonna. I said this to Senator Bruce um, last night uh, in an email, and I want to say it to you, Eric, and I would say it to everybody on the committee, including Peggy, um, and I want to also to Bryn and, and uh, Michelle, how much I appreciate 
everybody's efforts in these really trying times. I never, um, we've dealt with some easy issues and some really difficult issues in here. Um, and remotely is extremely difficult to deal with them. And it's been a teamwork effort on behalf of this committee, the staff, um, Eric, Michelle, Bryn, I can't thank you enough. Peggy, I don't know what we would have done without you. Um, um, I guess I'd have less hair than I do right now. I know it's my pleasure. <laughs> Even though I need a haircut. Um, <laughs> but I, I, Senator Benning and I'd probably be quite a bit balder if it hadn't been for all the efforts of the staff. So I just want everybody to know, and I appreciate the, the help of the committee. We've, we've come together in really difficult times dealing with extremely difficult issues. Um, and I, I do appreciate everybody's effort. Well, thank you, thank Senator you. Sears. I'll pass that along to Michelle and Brynn as well. Please and, do. Uh, and I will. Please do. We appreciate being able to, to work with the committee as well. It's a, it's a great privilege for us too. So thanks very much. Uh, Luke, that's an evaluation, by the way. <laughs> I was going to say, it's kind of nice my boss is on the line, Senator. Yeah, <laughs> I think that helps. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All, All right. right. Thank, thanks, thanks, everybody. Yep. We'll see you thanks. soon. I Bye will God. not wish good luck to the Yankees, though. Uh, <laughs> I know. I respect that. <laughs> Hi, Luke. Thanks for joining us. Hi, how are you? Uh, we're doing fine. We're, we're getting there. Good. Sorry about the slight delay there. No, no, no. Um, it's okay. And uh, um, I, I do hope I heard, you heard my comments about our staff and the terrific job they do. Yes, I share your incredibly high opinion about everyone you mentioned. So. Yep. Yeah, I hear I, you. and uh, I can't imagine any more difficult circumstances to work under. I, I can remember asking Bryn a question about it, the, the history of alarms. She said, I can't get to the state house to find out, what, you know, and how difficult some of these situations are. Um, we're, we're not, we do not have possession of the bill, um, but I thought... I would guess that somebody is going to say, has judiciary looked at the Global, War Global, Global Warming Solutions Act um, in terms of the changes in, in um, the cause of action piece? And so I thought that if somebody were to ask, that we should at least have discussed it in committee. And that's why I've asked. And I appreciate your being here, Luke. Um, it is the... It is an unusual, I think, but maybe not. And that, I guess we could turn it over to you to kind of explain what the cause of action does or doesn't do. Can I ask? Certainly. Yeah, uh, Senna, Alice. With regard to the cause of action, uh, I'm trying to figure out, is this with regard to the citizen's right of action or the when? Uh, well, it starts out saying, 10 VSA 594 cause of action, any person may commence an action and based Senator, upon the failure. Yep. And Senator Nick, I'm going to walk through that language and explain it to you. Okay, perfect. And just let me say, there's a lot of misinformation out there about this language. So what I'm going to try to do is run through the language for you, explain it, of course, answer your questions, but also talk about current remedies under current law. And Great. then what's similar to or different from what's in the bill. So a lot to talk about. I'll try to move through it quickly. And if there's any questions, please just stop me and ask. Peggy, have you made me a co-host? Yes. Great. So I'm going to share a PowerPoint with you. Uh, the PowerPoint has the language from that section of the bill in it. So you don't need to try to look at the bill online or jump back and forth. What I would suggest you do is just follow along in the PowerPoint. Please interrupt with any questions. But if you do that, I'll be able to show you the language and we'll walk through it and I'll answer your questions as best I can. And give me a moment just to pull up the PowerPoint and make it I'm just having some difficulty trying to uh, 
make it so you can actually see it. So just bear with me, please. Here we go. So good morning, everyone. Uh, for the record, Luke Marland, Director of Legislative Council. So I'm only going to talk in detail about the cause of action section, but I want to first explain to you how the bill as a whole works and how this part of it works. So what the bill does is, is establishes mandatory greenhouse gas reduction requirements in statute for three time periods. Then it creates the Vermont Climate Council and the Vermont Climate Council develops the Vermont Climate mm -hmm. Action Plan. That plan sets forth strategies and initiatives to achieve those mandatory greenhouse gas reduction requirements, but it's merely a plan. Then the law or the bill requires that A&R engage in rulemaking to implement the plan and achieve those greenhouse gas reduction requirements. And then last but not least, there is the cause of action if A&R either fails to engage in rulemaking or if it does engage in rulemaking, but those rules are insufficient to achieve those mandatory emission reduction requirements. So that's how this cause of action fits within the overall structure of the bill. Now, I'll walk through the language in the cause of action section, and I'll show it to you on the screen. But overall, it's broken into what I call two scenarios. Scenario A, which is that ANR has failed to adopt or update rules. They simply haven't done what they're supposed to do. And we'll talk about Rule 75, which is current law, the time frame and notice provisions, and the remedy. Scenario B is when ANR does adopt rules, but those rules aren't having the impact. They're not reducing greenhouse gas emissions sufficiently to meet those mandatory reduction requirements. And we'll talk about the time frame and notice and also the remedy provisions. Then there's two other subsections of this section. One concerns awarding costs and fees, and the other simply is boilerplate that states that this cause of action does not change or limit any other existing remedy under law, and we'll talk about those remedies. So now I'm gonna jump into the actual language of the section, show it to you and discuss it with you. But before I do that, are there any questions? So I'd mentioned scenario A or subsection A of 594. And this states that any person, and person is defined broadly, it could be a natural born person, an individual, it could be an organization or a legal entity, may commence an action based upon the failure of the Secretary of Natural Resources to adopt or update rules pursuant to the deadlines set forth in another section of the bill. So that's when a &R has failed to engage in rulemaking. Number so, one. Luke, yes. may I ask a question sure. there? Any person, that could be somebody from Connecticut, somebody from Belgium? I don't think so. A person is not defined in this bill, which means the general definition of person, which is set forth in 1 BSA 128, would be followed, and that does include uh, natural persons, corporations, legal entities, et cetera. However, Senator Sears, I think there still has to be um, certain requirements met. And so there would have to be someone who has some kind of particularized harm or can allege or okay. establish some uh, kind of particularized basis. So a person from Belgium, I think they have some have to have some connection to Vermont and this act and and um, the alleged failures under this cause of action. So, okay. Luke, why don't we then say that? Because I mean, I technically, a person exactly. living in Belgium is part of the globe. This is titled the Global Warming Solution Act. If they believe that Vermont is not doing its part to participate in that process, how would we um, counter that by saying you really don't have um, a legal leg to stand on to sue the state of Vermont? Well, as you know, Senator Benning, you have to come into Vermont to litigate the case here. You have to uh, usually show um, some basis, some connection to Vermont. 
some particularized harm for any cause of action. And as I walk through the language here, you'll see that this cause of action really has to do with a failure to engage in rulemaking or that there is a rulemaking, but it's ha not having the um, required emissions reduction results. And the way the emissions are defined are emissions within Vermont. So I still think you'd have to show that connection to the venue. And I still think you'd have to show that particularized harm in some manner. So I don't think that a person from Belgium necessarily could enter Vermont courts and take advantage of this cause of action. Thank you. Okay, please. So let me walk through the language. And this is straight from the bill. It's a word for word cut and paste. So under A, as I said, any person may commence an action based upon a failure to adopt or update rules. The action will be brought pursuant to rule 75. That's existing rule of procedure in the civil division of Washington County. Number two, the complaint shall be filed within one year after expiration of the time in which a &R was required to adopt or update rules. However, a person shall not commence an action until at least 60 days after providing notice of the alleged violation to the secretary. We'll talk about rule 75 in a moment, but this is a time period and a notice provision that is a little different than rule 75. Number three, this is the remedy. If the court finds that the secretary has failed to adopt or update rules pursuant to the deadlines, and there's a cross reference, the court shall enter an order directing the secretary to adopt or update the rules. If the court finds that the secretary is taking prompt and effective action to adopt or update rules, the court may grant a reasonable period of time to do so. So the remedy is not damages. The remedy is to order a &R to engage in rulemaking. However, if the court finds that the secretary is taking prompt action to do so, to fulfill that responsibility, the court can grant a reasonable period of time to do so. So this is what I call scenario A. Are there any questions about that? What would be the remedy, Luke, in the event the secretary gets an order from the court saying you must do X and the secretary is unable to complete that task? Is it simply contempt of court? That's a good question. And there's no additional remedy in the bill for that scenario. So you may know the answer to that question better than I do. I think that might be a possibility. Um, we're assuming in this bill, as in many bills, that if there's an order of the court, the, the defendant, in this case, ANR, would comply with that order, or certainly do their best efforts to comply with that order. Well, in the second uh, part of this process, first off, the, the plans have to be adopted, and I understand that process, but in the second part of this, we have to meet demands uh, that comply with what are now being taken from goals and made into mandates. And the question pops into my head, what happens if the mandate cannot be met? What what? That's scenario B. So give me a second. I'm just about to get to that. Okay. That's a little different. That's a very good question, but that's a little different. And uh, we'll get to that in one moment, okay? Any questions about A, what I've covered so far? No, I think that's good. Sure. So let's now look at what I call scenario B. And I'm just using this scenario A, scenario B to try to make it a little more clear. Uh, so, and by the way, Peggy, there's two people in the waiting room who are seeking admittance. I won't admit them, I'll allow you to do that. Yeah, I so, just saw that I'm getting them now. Great, thanks. So under B, any person may commence, and I, uh, I'm just waiting for that pop-up window to go away. Great, any person may commence an action alleging that rules adopted by the secretary have failed to achieve the greenhouse gas emissions reductions requirements. A, once again, the action is brought in Superior Court of Washington County. I'm sorry, uh, B1. B2, the complaint will be filed within one year of the greenhouse gas emissions inventory that already exists under current law. 
indicates that the rules have failed to achieve those necessary reductions. However, a person shall not commence an action till at least 60 days after providing notice. So it tracks the same time periods and the same notice provision as under scenario A. Number three, and this is what's relevant to your question, Senator Benning. If the court finds that the rules are, quote, a substantial cause of failure to achieve the greenhouse gas emissions reductions, the court shall enter an order remanding the matter to the secretary to adopt or update the rules to achieve those reductions. If the court finds that the secretary is taking prompt and effective action to comply, the court may grant the secretary a reasonable period of time to do so. And this came up in Senate appropriation. So let's play with a couple of hypotheticals. If ANR adopts the rules or making a good faith effort to achieve those emissions reductions requirements, but something happens that makes that impossible. The federal government does something that just, I don't know what, I can't think of a great example, but makes it impossible to meet those reductions. The court would have to find that the shortfalls in the rules themselves were quote, a substantial cause of failure to achieve those reductions. If it's not the fault of the rules, the court may not find that. Does that help answer your question a little bit, Senator Benning? Does mine. Um, it, it may, depending on what the circumstances are that are contained in the rule itself. Uh, if, if the Senate, uh, I'm sorry, if the secretary has done everything possible in a rule to meet, at least to their expectation, uh, the mandates that have been required by 25 or 30 or, or mm -hmm. 2050, um, the upshot is the secretary has done everything that was believed to be something that would work, but it doesn't work. The secretary now has um, is stuck between a rock and a hard place with the court system. Um, and, and I'm not, I'm still trying to wrap my head around what happens under that circumstance. Could the secretary produce a, a rule, uh, for instance, that prevents anyone from using a gas powered vehicle or, or device? I, I don't know the answer. I'm just trying to sculpt this and wrap my head around it. Well, that's, um, so just to step back for a second, if, Secretary does engage in rulemaking, good faith effort, but the federal government does something or something else happens completely out of the control of ANR or the state of Vermont that makes it impossible to achieve these emissions reductions. It could be that if a case is brought, the court would find that the rules are not a substantial cause of failure and therefore rule in favor of ANR. So that, that's yeah, um, a possibility. In other words, Matt ANR would win. I'm going to ask the question in a different way. And, and as yeah, so I can, sat, can I try to answer Senator Benning's? Oh, I'm sorry. Other I question. You had. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, as, then the, he was saying, well, can you have a rule that bans internal combustion engines? You know, um, any rule has to be constitutional. Any rule has to be workable and viable. Any rule can't be arbitrary and capricious. Any rule can't be preempted by federal law. So you can play with the outer realms of these hypotheticals, and that's understandable, but understand, as I think you know, through the rulemaking process, there's lots of guardrails to how extreme a rule could be and whether it's really could be implemented and achieve its goal. So that's what I wanted well, to say, Senator Sears. Sure. If, if I'm not sure the federal government is going to fall into this at all, frankly, because the onus is on individual Vermonters to help meet greenhouse gas reductions. So at some point, if the secretary is instructed that they have to meet X reduction in greenhouse emissions by a certain date, it's not the secretary who is going to be having to do that. It's the people of Vermont who are going to have to do that. And if a rule is presented to LCAR 
Um, LCAR is going to look first to legislative intent. Legislative intent is very explicit here about what goals are supposed to, um, what uh, mandates are supposed to be met by what year. And so I'm, I'm envisioning that there's going to be a battle somewhere down the road between what the secretary is forced to do to meet the legislative intent and what Vermonters as citizens are going to have to do to comply in order to reach that objective. I mean, that's only common sense to me. It's not going to be the federal government that's uh, responsible. It's not going to be the secretary who's responsible. It's going to fall on the onus of every individual Vermonter to have to respond in such a way that the overall objective can be reached. And I, that this is where I get nervous. I appreciate the explanation, but I have to say I'm nervous. Senator Sears, did you have a yeah, question? Yeah, I or? do. Well, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but as the wind was blowing here in my backyard, I got to thinking about acid rain and the impact it had on Vermont's forests and, and Vermonters. And um, it, we had little control over that. Um, A&R could have made all the rules at once, but it couldn't control what Ohio and Pennsylvania were spewing out of their smokestacks, nor could it. Um, so, uh, you know, I would think that anyone who brought an action for the failure of Vermont to stop certain emissions that it didn't have control over, the court wouldn't find that. But that's just common sense to me. I hope that's uh, somewhere in these rules or in the um, in this cause of action. Senator Nicka, did you have a question? And Senator Sears, I don't know if you want to recognize people or you want me to. It's a little hard on the uh, Zoom. I can't see anybody except <laughs> I can see Senator Benning, you and Senator Nick, and that's it. So if you want to recognize people okay. who want to. Sure. I don't have a question. Okay. So let me now proceed to uh, <clears throat> the next two subsections of the language, and then we'll talk about some other issues. So Subsection C has to do with uh, costs and fees. It says, in an action brought pursuant to this section, a prevailing party or substantially prevailing party, uh, one that is a plaintiff, so that would be an individual or entity suing a &R, shall be awarded reasonable costs and attorney's fees unless doing so would not serve the interests of justice or two, that is a defendant, in other words, a and in the state of Vermont, may be awarded costs if the action was frivolous or lacked a reasonable basis in law and fact. And a lot of this terminology is taken from other statutes or um, concepts that we hope the courts are very familiar with. For example, substantially prevailing party. I think you understand that term. It's, it's often used in other statutes. Um, would not serve the interests of justice is a phrase that we think the courts would be familiar with. So what we're trying to do here is use terminology that the courts are familiar with when they deal with costs and fees in other contexts. D states that nothing in this section shall be construed to limit the rights, procedures, and remedies available under any law, including the Vermont Administrative Procedure Act, and it has a citation. And so what is saying here is this new cause of action is additional it doesn't take the place of or limit any existing remedy under law. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So individuals would in essence have a menu, options under existing law, and then also perhaps this new cause of action. Are there any questions about that language? Uh, no, pretty, yeah, Senator Nick and then Nick Senator Benning. So I'm just wondering with regard to one, I mean, might this not be an ongoing problem from certain people who like to litigate something on this very small? <laughs> There's a lot of lawyers in this world. So could there be litigation? <laughs> yes, there could be. And but I mean, if a case is frivolous, so yes, could someone bring a case? Could someone bring multiple cases, perhaps? And your colleague could probably answer that better. But if it's a frivolous action, there's ways for courts to weed those out. 
So with respect to that, um, Alice, was your question answered? I'm sorry. Yes, I'm all set. With respect to that, Luke, I had a conversation this morning with the secretary and I asked, is there a device currently in existence which measures greenhouse gas emissions within the geographical confines of the state of Vermont? The answer was no, they use a modeling system. Mm -hmm. If an entity has a modeling system of its own and comes to the conclusion that greenhouse gas emissions objectives are not being met and brings suit as a result, even though the secretary's model says something different, that would not necessarily be a frivolous cause of action, would it? I don't know if a court would find that frivolous, but you do notice that under B in the language that I read to you, it talks about the um, greenhouse gas emissions inventory and forecast. And I said, that's the inventory under existing law. So the, what you're pegging it to, the model of emissions in Vermont, and you are correct, there's no uh, device that magically uh, monitors um, all greenhouse gases in Vermont. It is a, it is a modeling uh, process based on various data points. Um, but the language in this section pegs it to the inventory and forecast that is based on A&R's model. So that's the baseline. It pegs okay. it to that. If someone comes into court and makes some argument that that's inherently flawed and there should be some other model, I don't know if the court would consider that or not. That's hard for me to say. Section two, I do have a question about that. The word defendant is all encompassing, but the cause of action is specifically targeted at the secretary. Is there a reason uh, or is there a possibility of some other defendant appearing in something like this or is it merely supposed to be targeted to the secretary? It's targeted to the secretary. So is there a reason why we use the word defendant here as opposed to saying the secretary may be awarded I, reasonable cause? I think you could say um, secretary. Um, I had assumed that A&R would be represented by the AG's office. So it might be, you know, state of Vermont might be the defendant under the, the pleadings. I don't know, but it's really the A&R. We're not thinking that there's some outside non-A&R, non-state of Vermont entity that's a defendant. We simply use or I simply use plaintiff and defendant to try to model it on other statutes and try to make it as clear as possible. I just didn't but know I, whether there was another anticipated possible defendant out there that we weren't talking about. Not that I can think of. I see that the AG's office is on and they're going to testify after me and should definitely ask them the same question. But I read that as A&R in essence. Okay. Okay. Um, that finished, Joe or Luke? I, I have a question about um, if the state is, if the secretary or the defendant is sued, other than court cost, reasonable lawyers' fees, et cetera, there's no monetary damages to the state? There's um, no, that's correct. There's no damages under this cause of action. You are correct. Okay. So they, they wouldn't receive a million dollars because the agency refused to, or didn't, or failed to, the court found the agency failed to update the rules. Well, what would be the consequence if the agency, if the court found the agency failed to update the rules, would there be a order to, I mean, I, the one I think of is, is Lake Champlain, or uh, our lakes, you know, mainly Lake Champlain and the cleanup and the order from the courts to clean up. Would there be that kind of order? Could that? Well, so, I mean, I guess under this talking clause, from an appropriations as well yep. as a judiciary standpoint, would this create a situation where instead of educating kids, the court would say, you've got to put resources to this particular effort? Under this cause of action, this language in this bill, there are no damages, no, for example, punitive damages. There's costs and fees. Whether costs and fees could add up to a million dollars in some cases, I don't know. Yeah. But there's no damages. Okay. There might be a cause of action under existing law or a different theory that someone could bring. 
I think Lake Champlain had to do with federal law and was a very different type of situation. But right. could someone bring uh, a case that alleges other grounds that might result in damages? Perhaps. But under this bill, there's no ability in this cause of action in this bill to impose damages. Did that answer your question? Yes. Great. So we reviewed the language in the bill. So that's all the language about the cause of action established in the bill. What I want to do is briefly review existing law. So separate from what's in the bill, under existing law, there's an action pursuant to Rule 75, which I think you're aware of. And there's also an action pursuant to 3 VSA 807, which is part of the Vermont Administrative Procedure Act, seeking a declaratory judgment on a rule. So this is existing law. And I want to go through them quickly and then talk about what's similar or different compared to what's in the bill. So let's begin by looking at Rule 75. And what Rule 75 did is it, uh, in essence, combined and took the place of a number of previously common law writs, including the writ of mandamus, which is a common law writ to require a state official or state entity to undertake an action it's required to do. So this would be scenario A, where a &R is not engaging in rulemaking. This is a cut and paste of some of the language from Rule 75. I'm not gonna read through all of it. It's not all the language, but what it indicates, and I've highlighted some of the more important parts, is that an action or failure to act by an agency can be litigated pursuant to Rule 75. And you'll see under B, there's language about what the complaint is supposed to include and the demand for relief. Under C, there's time limits, which is a little different than what's in the bill. So it basically says, if there's no time, lit, time limit specified by another statute, complaint must be filed within 30 days or within six months after expiration of the time in which an action should have occurred. Then there's language under D about the hearing and judgment and under E, appeal. Are there any questions about Rule 75? So this would be most no. relevant to scenario A, where A&R is not engaging in rulemaking. No. Nope. You Go also ahead. have, and this is what I think would be most likely to be pursued, a cause of action under 3 VSA 807 for a declaratory judgment on the validity or applicability of rule. And this is something that the representatives from the AG's office uh, engage in and are experts in, and this is what I'm sure they'll tell you more about. So 3 VSA 807 states that the validity or applicability of a rule may be determined in action for declaratory judgment. You'll notice it's in the same court as a cause of action would be brought pursuant to the bill. Now, what are the bases when you bring such an action? The grounds upon which a court can invalidate a rule include that the rule exceeds a legislative grant of authority, the rules contrary to legislative intent, or, and this is most important, it's arbitrary, unreasonable, or contrary to law. I want to summarize for you what might be arbitrary or unreasonable, because you'll see it's a fairly high standard to meet. The term arbitrary is actually defined in 3 VSA 801. And it means there's no factual basis for the decision made by the agency that was engaged in rulemaking. The decision made is not rationally connected to the factual basis asserted for the decision, or the decision made by the agency would not make sense to a quote, reasonable person. And that definition also explicitly cross references two cases by the Vermont Supreme Court. And in those cases, one of which is called Town of Sherborne, the court stated that in determining whether an action of an agency is arbitrary, the court must determine whether the decision makes sense to a reasonable person, even if the reviewing court might have weighed the factors differently, and that the agency or department has wide discretion over what weight to give criteria and what conclusions to draw from them. Even if the board's proceedings or the agency's proceedings contains conflicting evidence, the findings of the board or agency will ordinarily be upheld by the court. 
In the second case, that's cross-referenced in the definition of arbitrary, it's called buyers. The Vermont Supreme Court repeated some of this same language, but also made clear that the court should not substitute its judgment for that of the rulemaking body. So if you look at 807, you look at the definition of arbitrary, you look at the Vermont Supreme Court cases interpreting that term, you'll see that it's a fairly high standard because there's a lot of deference given to the agency or department that's engaging in the rulemaking process. Are there any questions about that? Okay, and then last, I wanted to now pull these threads together. We talked about got, what, one question: Is sure. your PowerPoint on our webs on our committee page? Peggy? Yes, it is. Okay, good. Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, and so, what I want to try to do is now pull these threads together. We've talked about what's in the bill, the new cause of action. We've talked about existing law, and so I want to now compare the two and see what's what's different between the two. So, if So you'll see under scenario A in the bill, section 594A, it expressly refers to rule 75. Uh, the time in which to bring the action under rule 75 is 30 days or six months. Under the bill, it's one year. There's also a notice provision that's different. So in a lot of ways, I think A is quite similar to an action under rule 75, except under the bill, there's a notice provision and the time period in which to draw, to bring an action, excuse me, is greater. Now, if you look at scenario B, I have on the screen the various time periods. Under current law, 3 VSA 807, it's within one year of the effective date. Under the bill, it's one year after filing the emissions inventory. And in addition, under the bill, there's that same notice provision where the litigant has to give notice to ANR. Now, what's really different under the cause of action in the bill is unlike under 3 VSA 807, the court to rule against ANR would have to find that ANR's rules or the deficiency in those rules was, quote, a substantial cause of the failure to meet the emissions reductions requirements. And that's something we've already talked about at some length. And in addition, if the court finds that ANR is taking or seeking to take prompt and effective action, it can give ANR a period of time to do so. So these are the differences between the new cause of action in the bill and existing law. So there's been question raised, and Senator Sears, I think you asked this question in another committee earlier, and other people have asked it, well, so what's new, what's different? Is this new cause of action even necessary? And whether it's necessary or not, I think is largely a policy call for you to make. But it is clear that there are remedies under existing law. I think under any cause of action, whether it's under the bill or under Rule 75 or under the Administrative Procedure Act, you still have to establish standing and particularized harm. And that's what we talked about a few minutes ago. However, adding this language to the bill certainly provides certainty that there is a cause of action to enforce the greenhouse gas reduction requirements. So it does make that very clear. And I think under B, under the bill, it is a little different than what you might find under a cause of action under the Administrative Procedure Act. So there is, I think it does add a little bit, it is a little bit different. Under D in the bill, as I summarized earlier, nothing is taken away. And so what you really have is you have a menu. You might have Rule 75 if it applies, you have the Administrative Procedure Act if it applies. You might have another cause of action if it's applicable. And then you have this new cause of action set forth in the bill. So a litigant would have a potential range of options. And that indeed might be, as often in cases, there might be multiple alternative pleadings under the different causes of action. So I tried to go quickly because I know you have a bunch of witnesses. Yep. But are well, there any questions or anything you want me to talk no, about in more depth? I, I, I think you know you've done a great job of of helping me to understand at least what, in terms of the cause of action, there's an that's that's my uh, 
that's judiciary's only only focus here. I know there are a number of other questions about the bill and necessity of it, but it, our, our committee really should be focused on that. And I really appreciate it. Very helpful. Sure. I wonder if um, I see uh, Rob McDougall and uh, uh, Laura Murphy, I believe, are here from the uh, Attorney General's office. And um, either you could talk together or separately or any comments you have from the Attorney General, uh, whether the Attorney General's office supports, opposes, or is neutral. So, sure. Uh, thank you, Senator, and thank you. Thanks, Rob. Meeting. Yeah, good to see you. My gosh, Just, you know, PFOA goes away, and you, you know, yeah, well, it doesn't go away. Go away. I'm yeah, sorry, I was say, it right. does not go away. <laughs> yeah. the the remedies have, and I was just driving over the holes in my road um, from the final um, uh, lines extension. Um, so it's a pretty good feeling, even though it's bumpy. You know. Yep. No, it's uh, it's nice to see you again too, Senator. And um, the PFOA case has a long way to go uh, in the in the yeah. Superior Court, but uh, I'm glad to hear that yep. the work is ongoing down there. Yep. Um, the Attorney General, thank you for having us in, um, and thank you to the committee for letting us speak on this bill. The Attorney General um, supports this bill and the policies behind it. Um, we're in a place right now where we can no longer rely on the federal government to act on climate. Um, Vermont has fallen behind its neighboring states in achieving its emission reduction goals. Uh, the climate crisis is real and the time for Vermont to be an environmental leader is now. Uh, so from a policy standpoint, we, we support the bill. And I understand that the um, committee is asking us to speak about the causes of action section. And so yeah. uh, Luke yeah. just did a great walkthrough, obviously, of the, the causes of action section. And there's not a whole lot to add to that. Um, but Laura and I are happy to offer a few thoughts today. Um, the cause of action section obviously has um, two uh, new causes of action um, and also recognizes a third that's existing in law. Um, so as Luke said, the first one um, is that the agency fails to act if the agency fails to adopt the rule in a timely fashion, um, someone can bring a case under Rule 75 to require that the agency write the rule. <coughs> that one is probably the simpler of the two uh, that are new in the bill. And, and that's really a kind of either you did it or you didn't. And so um, to the extent that there's concerns about um, plaintiffs recovering attorney's fees and costs, that'd be a very uh, small I think attorneys fees and cost concern because, you know, it's really a black or white, did the agency meet the deadline or did it not meet the deadline? Um, the second cause of action is a little more, um, it, it's complicated. The, the second cause of action has where if the rules adopted um, didn't meet the greenhouse gas emission requirements. And so in that circumstance, you know, the case is brought within a year of the rule taking effect or within a year of the Vermont greenhouse gas emissions inventory being published. Um, in that case, you really are getting at uh, in court uh, a question of did the rule achieve its goals or not? And so that's where you may have competing experts. You may have a lot more litigation, deposition, discovery, that sort of thing to put the science into court to show whether the rule worked or not. Um, so that one, potentially there's some more exposure to fees and costs there on the state's part. Um, but Attorney General Donovan believes that um, the citizens of Vermont should have the right to pursue legal remedies when the state fails to meet its statutory obligations. To him, it's a government accountability. Um, the climate crisis is happening. It's real. It's a legitimate concern. And so the, the, the risks and concerns about attorney's fees and costs being paid are trumped by the um, idea that Vermont has to act on the climate. So that, that second one, you know, just to be very clear, that's where the, the exposure to fees and costs uh, is a little more significant. Uh, and then the third cause of action is not a new one, but it just in the cause of action section recognizes that um, anyone can still bring an APA rulemaking challenge mm -hmm. as you can in existing law. So, you know, like any agency that publishes a rule, if someone wants to challenge uh, 
the rulemaking process that happened, you can still do that. And so that's the third one. There's no attorney's fees or costs associated with that in this bill. Um, so that is a quick overview of the three causes of action that are there, two new, one existing. I'll just note that in um, the subsection C about the fees, um, I think in C2, um, it says the state, you know, if the defendant, um, if the case is, um, let me just get the language here. Uh, if the, the, in an action brought pursuant to the section, a prevailing party or substantially prevailing party, that is the defendant may be awarded reasonable costs if the action was frivolous or lacked a reasonable basis in law or fact. We have understood that, um, you know, that's obviously different than a plaintiff has reasonable attorney's costs and attorney's fees. And in other testimony and other committees in the House and Senate, we've noted that uh, we've understood that to be a typo and that the state should also have the ability to recover attorney's fees there. So it should say reasonable costs and attorney's fees, just like the plaintiff. Um, it has not worked its way into the bill yet, but we've flagged that in every committee we've been in. Um, so that's just one thing I'll point out. Um, and unless Laura has something to add, we're happy to answer any questions. Well, I just I would ask Luke if if there's a reason why that hasn't made it in. It wasn't a typo. Um, it certainly could be something that you change, uh, but the theory behind it was that the defendant A and R would be defended by the AG's office. AAG's salaries are already being paid by the state, so we wrote it that there might be costs that could be recoverable, but it wouldn't be that you're recovering the fees, which might be more to uh, AAG salaries. I don't know if so that's accurate. That, you guys can correct well, me, but I that's guess, why it was phrased no. that way. Well, that does bring up an interesting question though. Um, the, the Attorney General Donovan, uh, the Attorney General Donovan, Attorney General Donovan is on the record you just said that, supporting this bill. Um, but Attorney General Donovan would be defending the state. Is that a problem? No, no, we um, obviously we defend the state all the time, every day. And uh, I think that we are- Well, hopefully you're defending the state when you believe what you do. <laughs> no, and, and so we, um, you know, we we absolutely would expect to defend the state if a case was brought here, and we expect that the agency would do the proper rulemaking to meet the goals, and we would be ready to go into court to defend uh, the actions that they took um, to meet the climate plan goals, um, the rulemaking, and so um, we have no, there's no concerns for us about defending the state um, once the rulemaking has occurred. Um, and so I only flagged that attorney's fees and cost fees because, uh, you know, it seems like we should have the same ability to recover attorney's fees when a frivolous or reason, uh, unreasonable lawsuit was filed. But yes. um, I guess um, I, <laughs> thank you. Other questions for the attorney general's office and Laura, if you want to chime in, please do. So thank just, you. Nothing to add right now. Thank you. Um, just would like to say, um, I think we ought to put in, uh, if we aren't putting in the attorney's fees to the state, I, I see why, according to Rob, but let's put, let's put an amendment in that the state could get their cost. If it's a frivolous lawsuit, the state has to hire all kinds of scientists to testify. Are you requesting, so, are you requesting an amendment be drafted by Luke? Yes. We have costs in there now, to be clear. We, right now, the, the, the state can recover reasonable costs if the action was frivolous or lacked a reasonable basis in law. So we have costs now. It just was to parallel the plaintiffs. We thought it made sense to add attorney's fees, but. So Senator Nick, uh, okay. um, be glad to do an amendment for you or the committee. I think I just explained uh, the reason why we didn't include yes. uh, fees and that was a salary issue. Right. But, but, but if you'd like to, to do an amendment, it. Senator Nicker, I'd be happy to go number two in your list of amendments since N is before S. Okay. Look, so just can I follow up with Luke? So Luke, do, 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 do you think that costs are included there already? Maybe I misunderstood Rob, that we couldn't. So right now a plaintiff, that's the people suing a and yeah. can get um, costs and attorney's fees. 
Yes. Right now, the defendant, state of Vermont, AG's office, will only be able to get costs. So that would be the cost of hiring the scientists. That would be the cost of running some uh, data analysis, that would, et cetera. Okay, so and it's- get reimbursed for that. The reason why we did not include fees, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, uh, the AGs on the video call, correct me if I'm wrong, what we thought is fees is more your salary, the attorney's fees. And since AAGs are paid by the state and their salary is already being paid, we didn't add recovering that also. That was why we wrote it that way. <clears throat> Could be wrong. Uh, you tell me. Senator, wouldn't that, wouldn't that Senator. normally be interpreted as a court filing fee? Yeah. I'm just telling you why we wrote it that way, our logic. It may, there might be uh, something I, you want I to think, change, but I'm just explaining yeah. why we phrased it that okay. way. Okay, Let, let's, um, Senator Nick, uh, you still have the floor. Oh. So as I understand it, Luke, we don't need the amendment because the state could already, the agency could already recover costs in a frivolous lawsuit, not the attorney's fee. Right. They could recover the cost for scientists, et cetera, that they bring in to testify. Okay. So whether you need right. it or not, that's a judgment call. Make no comment. Yes, you basically summarized. What is there? What I was trying right. to explain. Right. But yes. they could not. But Rob has wanted to make specific, I guess, the attorney general. I'm going to say the attorney general wants to make it specific that attorney's fees would be recoverable. Is that correct? Right, but that's we have raised that in every committee we've been in that we think it should cost some fees. Senator White, who's late to the Do, subject, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you, and I'm I am sorry. I apologize, and I won't comment on anything else except to ask this question on this particular issue. Do we normally allow? Um, do we normally um, allow the attorney's fees to be recaptured, to be repaid in any kind of other suit? Say we file a suit against a pharmaceutical company. Do we allow the uh, your salaries to be recovered? And if we don't, then why would we hear? And if we do in other cases, why would we not hear? Lord, you know the answer to that one I, I don't there's not we looked at this issue i actually i actually don't know the answer to that in vermont i know there are other pro statutory provisions that provide for plaintiffs to recover attorney's fees for instance under the consumer yeah. fraud act and public records i don't actually know the answer to the question about defendants at the federal level um, there is a provision that allows for instance under some of the major environmental statutes attorneys, the the government to recover attorney fees and costs if the lawsuit is frivolous. So if you're looking at the federal model, no. those would typically include fees. I don't know about Vermont. Because I would say that if we don't in other, other cases in Vermont, then we shouldn't hear also okay. because it would be setting a whole new standard. Okay. And I, I, um, want to make sure we get the opportunity to hear from the administration. So, Joe, question, comment? I have, two, I have two questions, and Rob, Laura, the first is we had a discussion a few minutes ago uh, with Luke about the term person as somebody who is eligible to be a plaintiff. We used an extreme on Belgium, but let me um, first yeah. say that if we were to enter into a regional agreement with other states and say, for instance, the state of New Hampshire decided Vermont was not living up to its objectives of reaching the stated um, mandates by 2050. Isn't the term any person giving someone in, within that regional complex the ability to step in as a plaintiff? So. Senator, your question gets to standing. So it does say any person, but uh, a plaintiff still has to demonstrate standing before the court would have jurisdiction to hear the case. And so the test for standing is a fairly high bar for a plaintiff. Um, a plaintiff has to demonstrate basically 
three things. First, that they have suffered a concrete injury that is actual or imminent. Second, that the injury is fairly traceable to the state's failure to comply with H-688. Now, and third, that the court has the power to remedy the injury. So any person has to meet those the standing test. And so I'm not sure in your example if the court would find standing or not, frankly. And I, Laura might have something to add to that. Um, we will, you know, but that's my understanding is that standing is a pretty high bar in this instance, whether even though it says any person. Well, in the scenario that I gave of someone who is within the geographical uh, entity that is now a regional compact and Vermont is perceived as not doing its part, it's a pretty simple question. Do you think that somebody from New Hampshire or one of the other compact states has standing under the scenario that you've just laid out for standing purposes? So I think that gets to the second prong of that test, whether the injury is fairly traceable to the Vermont's failure to comply with this bill. And so I don't know in a regional context if you can zero out the state of Vermont from that region and say Vermont is the reason why this injury um, has happened. And the failure to meet the plan is the reason for that. So I, I think you, as you get to a bigger pool, it's harder to trace something individually to one state. And so I, I don't know if standing could be met in the example you gave, Senator. Let me ask it an easier way. Excuse is me, it possible Senator, that they Senator could Nick, actually have standing? you take over for a minute? I've got a, uh, something I've got to do. Yeah. So let me ask it a different way. Is it possible that they could have standing? They'd have to show that their injury is traceable to the state of Vermont's failure, and I'm I, not sure they could. I, I, I personally don't. I'm not sure they could in that example. Okay. I'm. The reason I'm bringing this up is I have a local issue right now with Act 250. Kingdom Trails in the Northeast Kingdom is essentially being challenged by somebody from Brattleboro asking for a judicial, a jurisdictional opinion on Act 250. And right now, the way things stand, that person down in Brattleboro is deemed to have standing to make that argument. And the problem that I see down the road is if we have a geographical area, a compact, if you will, on trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and the objectives for Vermont are not being met, can someone from the other states in that compact have standing to ask the Vermont courts to enforce the expected objectives? And I, I don't know why that's, it's seemingly a difficult answer. I'm not sure why, but it seems to me common sense would say they have met those three steps to obtain standing. And if I'm wrong, I'd love to know why. Okay. I would just offer, in addition to what Rob said, I think it, it may not really matter whether the state is part of a compact or not. The question I think would be, does the person, whether it's a state or an actual person or some other entity, have an injury that is caused by Vermont's failure to mitigate climate change. And so the injury would need to be tied to the actual lack of reductions in um, emissions that has been caused by Vermont's failure. And so being able, you know, one may be able to allege that in a complaint, um, being able to prove that I think gets a little more complicated, but really the injury should be tied to whatever Vermont's failure is in terms of emission reductions. And that could be someone, it's not necessarily a state who's part of a compact, but anyone who's really suffering from this, this, from this failure. Jeanette, uh, are you finished, Joe? This could go can, on. Can, can I follow, it could go on I for hours, I know, I, and I don't want to do that. Okay, so I, I, I just wanted to follow up on that, but weren't we very clear that uh, um, a lot of uh, the degradation of our forests and our air was due to um, Ohio's emissions? And didn't we? So I, I don't think that was very hard to prove. And so I, I understand Joe's concern here is I think that it, it 
might not be very hard to, to prove. And if a person from Brattleboro is claiming injury from a Northeast Kingdom trails thing, then, I mean, I, I, I don't know, but we, we did seem to blame Ohio for all of the degradation of camel's hump. Yes, and Jeanette and I are exposing our age at the moment because we're part of that generation that fought acid rain floating across the skies. And Vermont was being harmed by that. And I don't see that this is altogether a different scenario. Okay, uh, to go back to the issue of, oh, Luke, there you are. Yes, go ahead, Luke, speak. Thank you, and just to add in to what the AG's office was saying. So in this cause of action, the requirements of standing, of showing the particularized harm, all the other elements, is no different than under current law, any cause of action. And even if uh, this bill doesn't, well, if this language is taken out, but the bill goes forward under Rule 75 or under the Administrative Procedure Act, you would still have to show those same thing. And so just to build on what the AAG said, I'm often asked, well, could someone bring a lawsuit? Sure, lots of lawsuits are brought, but if they're frivolous, hopefully they're weeded out. And in any lawsuit, you have to show the standing, you have to meet that threshold. And no one can predict whether it would be met in a specific case but there has to be some demonstration of the standing to continue in court. Okay, so uh, just to follow up on the issue of uh, the costs and attorney's fees, I am thinking that uh, I would like to do an amendment with regard to that. What I'm thinking, Luke, is that if our AG's office did not have the expertise to defend in the kind of lawsuit that might occur, we might hire outside counsel whom we would have to pay that I think we should have that in there specifically for. Uh, I'd, I'd be glad, glad to write that for you and we can talk offline if you want about that. Okay. Or we could have the discussion here. I don't know if the committee wants to or not. I don't know, is the committee interested in that? I mean, I'm concerned that on, on a big, you know, some of these could be very big cases, with a lot of expertise and then maybe us needing to hire some outside counsel as has happened occasionally on a complicated case that we didn't have the in-house. I, I think since the attorney general brought that up, um, or, well, the assistant attorney general brought it up. Um, I, I'm happy to join you in that effort. Um, and uh, I, I think it makes sense. Okay. So if you could do that, please, Luke. Certainly. Uh, go, go ahead, Senator Sears. Any other questions for the Attorney General's office? Um, Megan O'Toole is here. I, I, Megan, you're up. Oh, Julie Moore's here. I don't know how you became Megan O'Toole. Oh, well, she's here as well. Oh, she's here. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So, um, uh, please, um, we wanted to hear from you on the cause of action. We're only looking at the cause of action. So, um, sure whether the administration's for or other against other parts of the bill is really immaterial. It's the cause of action that we're focused on. So any thoughts that the administration has either in support or against the cause of action, happy to hear. Excellent. Well, thank you. For the thank you for being here, by the way. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity to, to meet with you all today. Um, and, and Megan is, is here and available to help answer questions as well. Um, I assume most of you know her, but she is the, the lead attorney for our AIR program within the Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, I want to start by saying that the administration remains committed to the greenhouse gas emission reduction goals identified in H-688 and shares the sense of urgency um, that we believe is driving this legislation and the need to reduce um, our emissions and, uh, and enhance the resiliency of Vermont's infrastructure and landscape in the face of a changing climate. Uh, that said, the administration and myself personally remain concerned that as drafted H 688 sets up um, for sets us up for litigation and delay as opposed to ensuring our focus remains where it needs to be, which is on developing a comprehensive plan and then implementing it. Um, specific to the cause of action and the question you'd ask Senator Sears. Um, the cause of action is really focused on regulatory work, and we see that as problematic. As you know, the H-688 would establish a council, um, and we're envisioning that the council might recommend a range of different programs, funding mechanisms, and incentives. 
And the challenge with the cause of action would be that it, it cannot compel anything other than the regulatory work of the Agency of Natural Resources, which means we may be left with no choice but to pursue less efficient, more costly programs. Um, and while our the other piece I would flag for the committee is that while our authorities under Chapter 23 are significant, uh, they are not unlimited. We are interpreting that the language in H-688 does not provide the agency with new, any new authority or power. Um, so for example, we can't create new regulatory programs. We can't raise taxes or fees. Um, and we are concerned that there's some perception that the legislature uh, is giving us more authority than we're actually receiving and will also set up potential challenges. I would offer that the administration is consistently advocated for an approach um, not unlike the approach we've taken in clean water, um, which is where we've identified, we would start by identifying a suite of interim actions, um, funding pools, and to ensure continued progress as the plans being developed. Um, some of those measures were reflected in the governor's FY21 uh, recommended budget, although I know that, that that is not necessarily where we're at today. Um, we've also would then move to develop a robust implementation plan um, that would include both regulatory and voluntary measures. Uh, figure out how much it would cost to do all of those things and establish the amount of funding necessary to support implementation and then working with the legislature um, to identify and ultimately secure funding sources. Um, my concern is that, that in moving forward um, all the way through implementation without having a clear sense of cost and the types of measures that will be required, um, we don't have that kind of framework or certainty um, identified at this point in time. Um, and we really need, without belaying the sense of urgency that clearly surrounds our work on climate change, we need to approach that urgency prudently. Um, and I'm concerned that H-688's urgency may be a bit short-sighted and end up causing unwanted delay in the middle term with litigation taking center stage. Okay. I think that was pretty clear. <laughs> I, uh, are there questions? I guess I do have a question and that the attorney general defends the state against lawsuits, but the attorney general has come out in favor of the bill. Does that put you in a difficult position in your view, or is that not? A difficult position. I, I don't see that as a, a difficult position in, in large part because we, we support the intent of the bill, right? And, and there would be the administration, to the extent this is the legislature's direction, is committed to doing our, our level best um, to implement the, the statute and the requirements given to us. Um, I think the challenge from, from my vantage, frankly, is I feel like we're being put in the untenable position of being set up with very low likelihood, if any, of success. Um, as you're aware, yesterday in the Appropriations Committee, the funding for this work was, was removed. I know that that's the, the same approach the Appropriations Committee is taking with, with every bill. Yeah. I, I actually right made now. the motion, so I know. <laughs> right. Um, so. I, know that, I know that that's consistent with the approach the Appropriations Committee is taking on, on yeah. every bill at this point in time. Um, but to the extent that this bill advances and the funding becomes an afterthought, it's just further challenges our ability to, to be able to do this work and do it successfully. Understood, but um, well, we're not in the Appropriations Committee. Senator White. So this is a completely unrelated question, but then why are you Megan asking? is, but Megan, is your <laughs> name also Campbell? Yes, that's my maiden name. I, I didn't know that. And I just have to say that my committee deals with a lot of law enforcement issues. And I regularly invoke your dad's name as the way cops should be. Thank you. I've been thinking a lot about that lately, too. <laughs> I bet. Thank you. Well, thank you for that editorial comment. Comments, I way. just I just couldn't resist because I never have contact with Megan. Oh, in, well, in my, now you um, do. Now you do. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to respond. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there any other questions for either the secretary or for Megan? 
Megan, do you actually work for the secretary or for the attorney general? Um, I'm in the Office of General Counsel in the Department of Environmental Conservation. So, so you're yes. not connected to the attorney general. That's correct. Secretary so Moore is, you, is my client. Okay. So is there an, does, would you be able to defend the agency for failing to, for example, for <clears throat> failing to achieve the council's goals? So typically, um, when the attorney general represents the agency of natural resources, we we do work very closely with their council, and I work with Rob and, and Laura on and and other council in the environment section um, routinely in in their work uh, defending the decisions that that the secretary has made. Okay. Other Senator Benning. So Megan, sometimes attorneys lose cases. Let's assume for the moment you lose the case and directives have to be made to achieve the objected mandates. What comes next? So um, I think it depends on the particular challenge um, that we're defending um, in the cause of action section. Um, but uh, and Rob and Laura, feel free to to jump in here. Um, but I, I'm, you know, if we are uh, directed by the court to um, uh, revisit our our rules um, and uh, revisit them, you know, substantively to um, uh, achieve the mandates in the bill, um, then I suppose that that would be a um, you know, what would have to happen next is that we would revisit that and then it would also be a, a revisitation of the, the plan um, that the Climate Council has developed um, to understand, you know, what else needs to happen and what other authority we might need um, to actually achieve the goals. If the authority needed to achieve the goals meant imposing on individual citizens specific restrictions in order to decrease greenhouse gas emissions. Do you have that authority at that point or would it have to come back and go through the legislative process? So um, under chapter 23 in title 10, the agency has general authority to um, uh, take, uh, to, to adopt rules to um, reduce the emission of air contaminants. Um, and greenhouse gases fall within the definition of air contaminants um, in, in Title 10. So um, we, that's, that is the general authority that we have now. And, and we do typically use that broad authority when we implement um, or when we adopt rules to, um, to reduce emissions of air contaminants. So if it is determined by the agency that the only way to achieve the stated goals, mandates, I have to switch that word, the stated mandates is to ban all use of internal combustion engines. Do you have that power? Um, well, I, I think that's that's a question that's come up a lot. And I know that, that Rob and Laura specifically answered that question um, when they gave testimony um, in the House on this bill. So I'll certainly defer to them as well. Um, but I, I think that a rule that um, contemplated the banning of internal combustion engines, um, you know, would obviously have to meet all the procedural requirements of the Administrative Procedure Act, and then it would also have to be substantively valid. Um, there's also issues of federal preemption that come into that question. Um, the state of Vermont is um, preempted from regulating emissions from motor vehicles, um, except to the extent that our rules are identical to the state of California's. So um, uh, that's another issue that would have to be contemplated in that situation. Um, but it definitely uh, would welcome Rob or Laura to, to add to that answer as well. Rob or Laura, do you want to comment? Laura, do you want to take that question? Nothing to add to what Megan said. I think that's exactly right. The, any sort of ban like that would need to meet various requirements, including constitutional, U.S. constitutional issues, as Megan explained. So if I heard you correctly, as long as it met whatever California was doing at that moment in time, that would effectively meet federal requirements? Uh, yes, if... Uh, 
if, if to the extent that we are regulating motor vehicle emissions, um, they need to be identical to the state of California's. Okay. Other questions? Um, Senator White, uh, I, I'm gonna adjourn this portion of the meeting um, of Senate Judiciary and I thank all of you for joining us as well as Luke for all the help. Um, and uh, well, there'll be a debate on the Senate floor, that's for sure. Um, but Senator White, you missed my earlier comments to thanking the committee for its extraordinary work during this COVID-19 pandemic and getting some very tough bills through this committee. And um, I really do appreciate that. I also complimented our staff and including Peggy Delaney for all the hard work as well as Brian, Eric and Michelle. So I wanted to add that voice to you. You weren't here and I do really appreciate. It's been extremely difficult working remotely, but we've worked together as a team and I'm really thank, thankful for that. Um, thank so you, and I, I should thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Um, and if you'd like to vote on estate deeds. Yes, Jeanette. Life estate what? deeds, you have the, we voted out life estate deeds 302. Oh. If you'd like to be recorded as a yes, if you think people should be able to take care of their estates. As long as they don't use it to stick um, their nursing home bills to the rest of us because of refusing to, um, well, because of wanting to leave it to their kids. Yes. Well, thank well, you. Yes. You yeah. voted yes. <laughs> Technically, that was the enhanced life estate <laughs> bill. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, thank um, you. And so, uh, can Unless I say, there's any other, yes, Senator. Just one other thing, um, Jeanette or uh, Joe, do you want to sign on to the amendment that the state be able to recover costs and attorney's fees? Sure. That, and that doesn't include our own attorney's fees, right? Just external attorney's fees? Well, we won't have any in-house as I understand it because there, our people are on a salary. Right, as long you as- You might as need to clarify that. Okay, as click. long as it's clear, that if, because I don't want us to be in a position of making a different decision for this than we do for everything else. Okay, so you wanted to say something for outside counsel, something for external that. attorney fees. Can that work, Luke? I'll write whatever you want. What I'd written was attorney's fees. Um, I don't know. So I think you would have to decide what you want. I can write it. I'm not certain how it would play out. Maybe the AG's office could give. Some thoughts on that? I don't think there's time because uh, this is coming up this afternoon. At right. So, so what I wrote was just adding in attorney's fees, no limitation. I'd say that would be. If fun. you want me to limit it, I could. I'm not quite certain how that would play out in the real world. That's all I'm saying. If I can comment here, my only concern is that if we don't do it for other issues, I think that doing it here, starting a setting a precedent is there is not the right thing to do without a lot more testimony if we do it in other on other issues and other cases then it's fine but i think that we shouldn't do something new here i mean well, that's my i guess you'd prefer not to have your name on the amendment the difference what, the difference this is we, we, we have to go to another meeting i have to go okay. to so okay joe do you want to be on Sure. Okay. So um, it'll be the three of us. The three okay. of us. On it and gotcha. It. Thank you. So I'll need to get it. To We're just following the attorney general's lead. It's, it's yep. on its way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Luke. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. I may Thanks. not be here this afternoon, so if if I'm not there, just know that I'm with you in spirit. I'll see you all in August, and let me know if you need anything between now and then. Okay, yeah, we're not meeting tomorrow, so thank oh, you, uh -huh. Peggy.